BBC Radio proudly presents... It's nothing to be proud of, I can assure you. Thank you. Presents the newly discovered case book of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> the journal of Dr. John H. Watson, regular contributor to the British medical journal, which stethoscope magazine, and inventor of the self-raising thermometer... <laughs> I am also somewhat highly chuffed to be a close personal friend of and constant companion to Sherlock Holmes, England's greatest detective and foremost toughy-nosed ponce. <laughs> Not all of our pursuits together were in the line of duty. Sometimes we enjoyed more relaxing pleasures such as the ballet, a chamber concert, all in frog wrestling. <laughs> or a particular favourite of Holmes, a cockfight. <laughs> illegal, of course, but that was part of the attraction for him. <laughs> My favorite pastime was spending an evening at the music hall, and one such occasion resulted in a most bizarre case, which Holmes called the mystery of the obese escapologist. What amuses you, Watson? You've had that most singular smirk on your face ever since we boarded this growler at Baker Street. I'm happy, Holmes. You know how the prospect of a gay night out with you fills me with delight. <laughs> One day that phrase will take on a whole new meaning, I assume. <laughs> oh, look, we're passing Clapham Common. There we are. <laughs> I have to say, I only accompany you on this frivolous jaunt out of a sense of loyalty. Now, just sit quietly and be grateful I am gracing you with my presence. My favorite comedian is on tonight. Oh, yes, I know. Hails from Leeds, I understand. Willie Eckers like. <laughs> the Yorkshire wag. Such a vulgar little man. Ah, oh, we must be there, Holmes. Wilton's Music Hall. Now, be honest, Holmes. The place positively radiates jollity. Who knows what delights await us behind those portals? You're welcome to find out, Watson. That's the gentleman's urinal. <laughs> what? We appear to be stuck in traffic. We'll alight here and walk the rest of the way. It's only around the corner. Very well. I still say the music hall attracts the lowly classes and encourages immorality, which is why women of questionable virtue frequent this area. Uh, no doubt you're referring to the painted strumpet lurking in that dark doorway ahead of us. Walk straight past Watson and give her no encouragement to ply her disgusting train. Hello, dearie. Fancy a short time with a naughty girl? <laughs> Be off with you, harlot. Oh, Dr. Watson, I haven't seen you down these... <laughs> Why, I, 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 I think you've got the wrong person, madam. You know this pathetic creature, Watson. Mr. Holmes, you as well. <laughs> oh, it's been at least a week. Holmes, I am, I am truly shocked. Here, I still owe you some change after the last time, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> You'd only got a ten-bob note, if you remember. <laughs> Why don't you put a sock in it, Rosie? That'll cost you half a crown extra. <laughs> Come along now, folks. Performance starts in ten minutes. Get your tickets at the box office. There's a nice little bit of character acting there, Watson. <laughs> yes, Holmes, we need to go in. Uh, not before time. Good evening to you, madam. Watson, get your wallet open and purchase the tickets. So you know, Rosie, then? Uh, she helped me with my inquiries once. Is that what you call it? Unless you want to poke in the eye with a gloved finger, I suggest you change the subject, Watson. Get the tickets. Oh, very well. Uh, good evening. Uh, two ninepennies, please. A packet of butter kissed and a bag of whelks. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Lend me your program, Watson. I wish to ascertain the names of the performers I am expected to endure over the next two hours. Ah, uh, let's see. Hubert Truss. <laughs> Uplifting balladeer. <laughs> Boring. Yeah. Freeman, Hardy and Willis. <laughs> Foot fetishists in harmony. <laughs> Dolores and her yodeling gerbils. <laughs> Huge Deeney, the obese escapologist. And Willie Eckerslike, the Yorkshire wag at a veritable feast for the senses. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Wilton's Music Hall for another cornucopian carouse of cacophonous crap. <laughs> Before we proceed with this evening's effulgent entertainment, oh. I have an announcement to make. The management regrets 
that due to unforeseen circumstances, our top of the bill, Willie Eckers like the Yorkshire wag, will be unable to appear tonight. <laughs> However, Wilton's Music Hall is delighted to announce that we have obtained the services of the East End's answer to the Swedish Nightingale, the Leighton Buzzard herself. <laughs> Miss Eleanor Bentry. <laughs> Elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> Never heard of her. But first, prepare yourselves to be both amazed and amused by the mellifluous, madrigalian music of Dolores and her yodeling gerbils. <laughs> Dear reader of this journal, our evening at the music hall turned out to be a reasonably edifying affair, although, alas, Miss Eleanor Mentry was no match for Willie Eckers like the Yorkshire wag. We thought nothing new of that evening until a week later. It was late afternoon, and Holmes and I were relaxing at 221B Baker Street. What time is it? You just said in the narration, late afternoon. No, 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 no exactly. What time is it exactly? Twenty past three. Enter. After afternoon tea and some Battenberg dainties. You'll have to have it early today because I'm going out. Where are you going, Mrs. Hudson? I do not wish to discuss it. But you must, Mrs. Hudson, otherwise we can't continue with the plot. Oh, well, if it's that important. My sister and I went to Deacon's Music Hall last night because our favourite comedian was on, Willie Eckers like the Yorkshire Wag. Oh, he's my favourite comedian as well. He was indisposed. The management said due to unforsaken circumstances. <laughs> Dear me, that's... That's two weeks running he's failed to turn up for a show. Most unprofessional. Mm. Who appeared in his place, Mrs. Hudson? Some screeching old boiler called Eleanor Mentry. Or rather, the blade on a knife grinder stone make a more mellifluous sound than she did. A most impressive allegory, Mrs. Hudson, particularly from someone from the lower classes, such as yourself. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Patronising git. <laughs> I almost heard that. <laughs> you were meant to. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a programme of last night's performance? Yes, I have it here in my apron pocket. How convenient for radio. May I glance? <laughs> May I glance through it? Well, you can have it for eight, me. That's half of what I paid for it. Capitalist cow. Oh, every little helps. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go and console my sister. Hmm. I find the fact that a popular performer such as Willie Eckers like the Yorkshire Wag should miss two separate weekly engagements without an explanation of his absence intriguing to say the least. I suppose there's nothing in the programme appertaining to Eckers likes indisposition, is there? No, it? no, no. He is billed to appear alongside the usual dross, the Draylon Brothers, <laughs> boasting the best material in the business, <laughs> Igor Blimey, the hunchback Cockney troubadour, and huge Deanie, the obese escapologist. Oh, we saw him at Wilton's, remember? I liked him. How simple are your pleasures, my dear Watson. Come along. We shall go to Deacon's Music Hall to make inquiries. And Watson... Yes, Holmes? Don't dunk your Battenberg. It's not nice. <laughs> dear reader of this journal, Holmes and I hailed a horse-drawn music link to transport us to the manager's office at Deacon's Music Hall. <laughs> Mr. Delfort. <laughs> or may I call you Bunny? Now, as proprietor of this musical, how many times have you employed Willie Eckerslike, the Yorkshire wag? This week was to have been the fifth time already. He's never let me down before. Such a reliable performer. Vulgar without going too far. We had one comic on last week, stood on this very stage and said, and I quote, I see they've just opened a station in honour of our most glorious queen. Yes. It's called Oscar Wilde Central. Outrageous. Yeah, what's a man to do? He packs them in and I've got to make a living. Thank you, Mr. Delphorn, for that most illuminating diatribe, but not for building your part up, which you've been trying ever since rehearsal was done. <laughs> Have you been made aware of the nature of Willie Eckerslike's indisposition? Right, not, gentlemen. He turned up on Monday morning for his band call, seemed his usual self. Then he went into his dressing room to set out his props. Oh, have you seen his routine with the exploding ferrets and the blast of air out of his trouser leg? <laughs> Paralyzes them, that doesn't. Really? Mm. I happen to know he stole that routine. 
It used to be Disraeli's party trick at the Windsor Castle Christmas party. <laughs> Royal children loved it, and so did I. However, do continue. While Willie was in his dressing room, he had a visitor. There was a bit of a commotion. Then I heard one and a half sets of footsteps clattering down the stairs and out of the stage door. One and a half sets of footsteps? Yes. They must have been in such a hurry, Willie didn't have time to put his artificial leg back on. <laughs> so Willie Eckers-like was a monoped. I didn't know that. By Jove, I'm quite flabbergasted. Watson, the man was a comedian, not a tap dancer. <laughs> Do you still have Willie's leg, Mr. Delphon? Yes. I've been using it as a draft excluder under my door. <laughs> Here you are. Oh, uh, my word. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is all that remained of Willie in his dressing room, although I did find this on the staircase. It's just a book of matches. It's not just any book of matches. See what's printed on the cover? The Battersea Workhouse. That will be our next port of call. We shall take our leave of you now, Mr. Delphont. Watson, bring the artificial limb with you. Why me? I shall feel most conspicuous carrying such an item. Then shove it down the front of your coat, and if anyone asks, say you're Rolf Harris, right? <laughs> Whoever he might be. But what if Willie comes back for it? Tell him to hop on a bus to Baker Street. <laughs> Come along, Watson, shake a leg. Shake a leg. <laughs> Who said us toffee-nosed ponces don't have a sense of humour? <laughs> Dear reader of this journal... Dr. Watson asked me to read out this next bit as he's got an appointment with his barber and tailor. Well, he wants to look his best when he goes to the Battersea workhouse. Don't ask me why, he's as big a ponce as Mr. Holmes. <laughs> anyway, two hours later in the superintendent's office at the Battersea workhouse. I must say, Dr. Watson does look a right lardy with his waxed moustache and Savile Row schmutter. Good day to you, gentlemen. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. We had a slight emergency in the punishment quarters. Some of our guests working the treadmill have been discovered taking steroids. <laughs> They're being severely chastised by having the hairs up their nostrils plucked out with tweezers. What can I do for you? Hello, another one building his part up. You, <laughs> you are the overseer of this workhouse, I believe. I have that honor, sir, so to speak. The name's Dick Nasty. Mr. Nasty to my underlings, but I would be most honored if you would call me Dick. <laughs> no, I'd rather not. Can I offer you some refreshment? A cup of gruel, a bowl of sops, a whack dropping infested crust of bread, perhaps? No thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Tempting though your offer is, we've already dined. I'll come straight to the point, Mr. Nasty. Has this man been admitted to your workhouse recently, Watson? Show him the theatre handbill with Willie Eckers-like's photograph on it. Oh, yes. There you are. Oh, the devil take me, yes. Is that who he is? We're about to admit him to the asylum. A hopeless case. In fact, he's in the room next door being processed, so to speak. Mr. Mackay, bring number 297 in here, if you'll be so kind. Oh, I say, that is most barbaric. How can the poor fellow hop with his ankle shackled? I'm sorry, gentlemen, but it's in the workhouse walls. Anyway, is this the man you seek? By Jove, yes. Uh, Mr. Eckers-like, we are your friends and we're here to help you. Oh, kawari, you, you poncified wig malaria's. Sling your hook before I gear smack in the gob with a wet haggis. <laughs> Great Moira Andersons, it's worse than I thought. <laughs> the poor wretch is totally deranged. He's under the delusion he's a Scottish fishwife. A useless haggis brained eagly eyed clouty dumpling. A gear garbles kiss on the head. I'll flatten you, you mickle brain. Thrust it up. <laughs> Dear reader of this journal, we could only watch helplessly as the poor wretch that was once the Yorkshire wag was dragged off by the manacles to the Happy Glades Lunatic Asylum in Bognor. <laughs> Holmes and I returned to Baker Street. Stopping off at the tobacconist on the way for Holmes' usual rough shag. <laughs> then, back in our lodgings, the country's foremost detective, with lit Meersham in one hand and mirror in the other, took time off to smoke and reflect. Mmm, marvellous. Most satisfying. Your pipe tobacco? No, my reflection in the mirror. No. <laughs> What was it you were rambling on about in the cab? I was telling you that there was another former music hall artiste in that workhouse. Really? Yes. I saw him as we left. The poor wretch was none other than Percy Endwards, the farmyard impersonator. Yes, I remember him. 
He didn't do the noises, he just did the smells. That's I remember. Right. The most disgusting act he was. Suddenly disappeared from the circuit, one assumed due to the unpopularity of his performance. Well, I have the program of the night I saw him. It would have been about six months ago. Mm-hmm. Let me see. There. Yes, here it is. He was third on the bill. Look. Mm. A bill shared with, among others who I won't mention, as we've milked the funny names to death, Huge Deeney, the obese escapologist. The very same. Strange how this man is always appearing the same week as the artists who have subsequently disappeared. Watson, how do you fancy doing a turn? What? You and I are going to become musical performers. Oh, just arrived in this country from France, where we've been a huge success. We shall find out where Huge Deeney is next appearing and make sure we're on the same bill. Ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who ain't too sure, <laughs> welcome to Music All Night at the Spittoon and Cesspit, Dagenham's most sophisticated night spot. Top of our bill tonight is that international star, Huge Deeney, the obese escapologist. But first... We welcome from across the English Channel a couple of frog geezers called Monge 2 and Petit Poir. Bonjour, bonjour. Good evening, good evening. Thank you, we've heard it. Good evening. And watch your cocks. If you will pardon moi slipping into the vernaculars there. I am Monge 2 and this is my bijou Gallic chum Petit Poir, who sprechen the no anglais. Je suis non English. Exactly. Tonight, we are pleading to present our world-famous Adagio Act, which we performed in the French Review, plastered in Paris. <laughs> what a pissoir up that was. <laughs> and for the climax, Petit Poir here will take off all his clothes, then do the splits over a bucket of live lobsters. Do what? <laughs> he say, which as everyone knows, is French for my pleasure. But first... Uh, <laughs> I'd like to sing a song made famous by your very own Harry Champion. I can't do my belly button button up. Can't do my belly button button up. It's so tight, serves me right. Must have eaten too much grub last week. I can't do my belly button button up. And do you think it's treasure What's the use of buttoning the other belly buttons when the belly button button's undone? I don't mean maybe the belly button button's undone. Bonsoir! Oh, there you are, Monsieur Toot. If Mr. Genie finds out I've let you in his dressing room, he'll have my guts for garters. Or worse, the other way round. <laughs> yeah, what do you want in there, anyway? Ah, uh, we are the old chums, huge, and I. We work together at the Gas Mantle Fitters Club in Hartlepool. And I'm wishing to surprise him with a little present. Come along, petit. Move your derriere. Oh! Strap up. What's the matter with your friend? I'm afraid one of the lobsters is refusing to let go. Oh! I wonder what that was wriggling in your trousers. <laughs> oh, Blarney, look at the time. I've got to go on the door and chuck in a few more undesirables. See if the set now. Now, let's search huge Deanie's dressing room while he's performing his act. There must be some clues in here. I don't like this at all, Holmes. Huge Deanie could come in at any time and discover us. Be quiet, Watson, and put that lobster down. Now, help me search. I'll see if that tall boy in the corner has anything to offer. By Jove, there's a feed line if ever there was one. <laughs> ah. What have we here? You found something? Yes, a suitcase containing clothes. Clothes to fit an average-sized man and... Yes? An artificial leg. My God, there's an orchestra in here as well. <laughs> the whole pub must have heard that. We'd better make a hasty retreat back to Baker Street. I'll take the suitcase. You bring the wooden leg. Oh, not again. Dash it all, Holmes. It's not decent. It hasn't got any trousers on. Watson... You are getting dangerously close to a you-know-what. Smack bodies. Precisely. <laughs> so stop faffing about and follow me. Very well. Dear reader of this journal, the following morning in our rooms at Baker Street, Holmes had a visitor. It was none other than Rosie, the tainted woman who plied her trade outside Wilton's Music Hall. She brought with her an item of considerable interest and assistance to our investigations. 
When Rosie left, minus the item she had brought, plus half a crown for her trouble, less the change she owed my colleague from a previous... <laughs> uh, previous interview, Holmes had three artificial legs on the table to study. You made a meal of that, Watson, didn't you? <laughs> yes, this is most interesting. It would appear that... Damnation, will I never be allowed to continue? Oh, who's an old misery guts this morning? What do you want, Mrs. Hudson? Saints preserve us. What are you doing with three artificial legs on my table? I thought I'd build myself a grand piano and start with something to support it on. <laughs> Don't you come the old acid with me, Mr. Holmes, or I'll start spitting in your coffee again. <laughs> I only asked a civil question. Holmes is conducting an inquiry at the moment, and we think these limbs may provide clues. Not think, Watson. No, for sure. Oh? Wooden legs can tell us a vast amount about their owners. No doubt you've read my monograph entitled Characteristics and Quirks of the Prosthetic Limb and its Role in the Criminal Fraternity. Uh, no, I confess I haven't ploughed through that one. Oh, I have. I come across it when I was rummaging through your drawers. Did you? Yes. This one, if I'm not mistaken, is an LJ Silver Mark I with ball-jointed hollow patella. And this looks like the A.A. Deluxe 1874 model, also ball-jointed with Olo Patella. I congratulate you on your acute knowledge of the subject, Mrs. Hudson. You are quite correct. And this third one is a fine example of the work of Kelly from the Isle of Man. <laughs> all three constructed by different manufacturers, but all three with something in common. They've all got Olo Patellas, am I right, Mr. Holmes? Yes, Mrs. Hudson. On this one here, I discovered a residue of powder which I thought at first might be chalk to stop the joint from squeaking. Until I sniffed and tasted it, that is. Uh, what was it, Holmes? Well, when I came down from the ceiling, <laughs> I realized it was pure opium. You know what I think? Oh, my stars. You're not saying these wooden legs is being used to smuggle opium in the knee joints, are you? I cannot abide a smart-ass housekeeper, Mrs. Holmes. <laughs> Isn't there something you should be doing in the kitchen? Oh, yes. I came up here to give you this letter which arrived in the midday post. Yeah. Dear Sherlock Holmes, I believe you have a number of items belonging to me which you're not entitled to. I shall call at your lodgings to collect them. Your humble servant and admirer. P.S. This is me ringing the doorbell right now. You better let him in, Mrs. Hudson. Right you are, Mr. Holmes. Stupid git. Who do you think it could be, Holmes? My guess is that it's Huge Deeney, the obese escapologist. Or his alias. His alias? You remember the suitcase we brought back from his dressing room? You said it contained clothes to fit an average-sized man. Mm -hmm. These clothes are the ones that the overseer of the Battersea workhouse was wearing. Dick Nasty? By Jove, you're right. Mm. Very observant of you, Mr. Holmes. Just one of my many attributes, Mr. Deeney. I can't get over it. A turn in my house. Oh, do you think I could have your autograph, Mr. Huge? I never give autographs, madam. Snotty pillock. <laughs> He's no more a turn than I am, Mrs. Hudson. Your straitjacket escape while submerged in a vat of cottage cheese failed to impress me, Mr. Deeney. Oh, I don't know. It impressed me, Holmes, particularly for a man of his, uh, pardon my bluntness, girth. Girth? <laughs> Pass me that hat pin, Mrs. Hudson. Well, here you are. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to give Mr. Deeney a slow puncture. You have, sir. Oh, <laughs> by Joe, Holmes, he's deflating. <laughs> Not Mr. Deeney, Watson. Just his rubber fat suit. Oh. And underneath we find Mr. Dick Nasty, overseer of the Battersea Workhouse. Well, I'm blessed. Mm. You appear to be well informed, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps you would care to elucidate. Not in front of Mrs. Hudson, never. <laughs> oh, don't mind me. Oh, very well. <laughs> Thanks to Rosie, my tarnished visitor earlier this morning. You mean your bit of totty? Succinctly put, Mrs. Hudson, thanks to Rosie, I learned a great deal about what's been going on. It would appear a large number of her clients are members of the Music Hall fraternity. And another of her clients was, and I use the past tense, was none other than Dick Nasty. Purely business, I assure you, not pleasure. Uh, cover your ears, Mrs. Hudson, the man has a filthy tongue in his head. Get naughty, Doctor, this is getting interesting. <laughs> if I might be permitted to continue, Rosie would provide the names of all the one-legged musical performers she encountered to Dick Nasty, who then set about gaining their confidences. What easier way than to disguise himself as Huge Deeney, the obese escapologist, and contrive to be on the same bill as the aforementioned monopeds. 
nasty bribed them to smuggle opium back into this country, cursed their wooden limbs whenever these artists performed abroad, and within a few months had the most profitable business in operation. Would anyone like a nice cup of tea? <laughs> <laughs> Not now, Mrs. Hudson. Holmes is showing off. Inevitably, his single-limbed couriers became greedy or threatened to unmask him, so they had to be silenced. They were kidnapped, taken forcibly to the workhouse where their memories were erased by hypnosis. The latest victim was the owner of the leg Rosie brought me this morning. Peg Leg Peregrine, the hopping balloon sculptor. Well, Sherlock Holmes, my admiration grows by the minute. Will it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you have omitted one important detail. I know, I know. I haven't finished yet. Oh, oh God. God. Oh. <laughs> There's only one person who comes anywhere near close to my master in disguise, and I happen to know he has a second cousin twice removed by the name of Miss Eleanor Mentry, the Leighton Buzzard. Stand back, everyone, while I unmask the fee. Oh, my star. Bless my soul, if it isn't... Yes, none other than my archest of arch enemies, Professor Moriarty. Curse you, Holmes. I warn you, this sword is loaded with bullets. One false move and I'll be forced to strangle you with it. Not so fast. <laughs> See? This paper bag here is full of air. You make one false move and I'll burst it in your face. You swine. You know how I hate brangs. That's that not case... what Mrs. Hudson said. <laughs> Be quiet, Holmes. In that case, I shall have to adopt another of my ingenious disguises and make my escape. <laughs> you think that will outwit me? You cannot hope to match my superior brain when it comes to the art of disguise. Oh, yes. Then what about this? <laughs> And what was that supposed to be? A Yorkshire Terrier being sick on a swing. <laughs> oh, really? Stand back. Butchers Landers! Saints <laughs> alive, Mr. Holmes. What on earth was that? A Spanish galleon in full sail with its own following wind. <laughs> this has gone far enough. Yes, it's all getting very silly. How about disguising yourself as gentle doves? Doves of peace, or is that too difficult for you? A dove? I can't do a dove. I can do a pigeon. Oh, oh, look out, Holmes. He's making his escape. Oh, lots of mussy. He's blown out the window. Quick, pass me my 12 bore Meersham. Did you get him? No, but I've just neutered next door's cat. That's, just... <laughs> That's it, then. You've let him get away, Mr. Holmes. He stuffed you. I think not. We'll just sit here quietly for an hour or so. He'll be back. What makes you so sure? The idiot disguised himself as a homing pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> That was the newly discovered case book of Sherlock Holmes. The part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Mr. Royston Hudd, Dr. Watson by Mr. Christopher Emmett, and Mrs. Hudson and other feminine characters were depicted by Miss June Whitfield. The portrayal of Professor Moriarty and a multitude of other masculine characters was rendered by Mr. Geoffrey Whitehead. At the pianoforte was Mr. Ian Smith, the dialogue was scribed by Mr. Anthony Hare, and the entire extravaganza was produced by Mr. Christopher Neal.